Hi guys, uh, welcome to Singapore. We've got quite a treat for you here today. Uh, we have, should be four, uh, but we have currently three of some of the most uh, brilliant people in the stablecoin space. And as we all know, stablecoins are at a point of inflection. So uh, what a perfect time to be speaking about it with some of the most expert people in the space. Um, my, my name's Haonan, I used to be at Optimism, just started a new company, still in stealth. Let me do quick intros here with our, our luminaries here. We got uh, Philip from Elixir. Philip, maybe you could give us uh, two or three sentences about yourself. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, I appreciate the uh, the intro. So <laughs> yeah, so real high level. We, we um, got our fourth guy here. <laughs> we'll wait. <laughs> hey, how's it going? You didn't call me. What? There you go. Hey, how's it going? Um, <laughs> all right. We're, Phil's probably here. So, yeah. yeah, so uh, pleasure to meet all you guys. Um, so yeah, my name is Philip Forte. I've been in the crypto space since 2016 when I started the Carnegie Mellon Blockchain Group. I was present there until I graduated from CMU. Um, I started another company called BlockVenture, which I ran for about two and a half years um, up until, yeah, around three years ago when I sold that to go all in on Elixir. So that's my background. I'm Nick. I'm one of the co-founders of Agora. We've launched a new centralized US dollar stablecoin, more on my background. First got into crypto in 2016. When I was working for a hedge fund, spent my whole career as a technology investor and then left a year ago uh, to bring an open model to centralized issuers and get rid of the duopoly. Hi, I'm Luca. I'm one of the founders and CEO of M0, so decentralized stablecoin uh, architecture. I've been in crypto in the MakerDAO ecosystem for a while as a researcher, investor. I used to be in traditional finance for like 15 years uh, in capacity, like investment banking, hedge fund management. I thought I had the best outfit here, but then Seraphine shows up. You're pretty good though. I like your trousers, man. They're good. But um, yeah, I'm Seraphine from Athena. We're a synthetic dollar thing. Uh, we launched in February. Um, we went to, I think, 3.6 billion TVL. It was 2.6, but it's okay. I can live with that. Um, I did like grow for Lido before that. I did some other shit before and some trap for I2. So uh, yeah, a little bit of everything. So we have a range of approaches here and uh, four different visions for the future of stablecoins. My goal here today is to extract as much alpha out of these four as possible uh, for the audience and for those listening at home. So I, I hope you guys don't mind. Um, maybe to summarize these different approaches, uh, Nick's approach is a uh, very safely collateralized, highly institutional, highly legitimate approach. Uh, we have uh, the M0 approach, which is a highly innovative middleware approach to the future of stablecoins. We have Seraphim with a tokenized carry trade, uh, which is one of the ideas I wish I had thought of. Uh, and we have Philip with a very promising launch of FastUSD on Say. These are different visions of what the future should look like. And I'm curious for the panelists here today, you know, Tether is the king today. How do you plan to dethrone Tether? I think there are four compelling theses here and I'd love to get them fleshed out. All right, well, we'll start. So I think that Tether is serving a pretty interesting use case. I mean, they've just been around. They're the most Lindy. Um, you know, with DUSD, I think that like, like the approach is that there's a portion of the backing that is in treasuries that's earning treasury yield, and then there's a portion that's earning the funding trade. Very similar to um, how like MakerDAO has DAI, right? DAI, SDAI, when you, when you stake DAI to get SDAI, there's a few different sources of yield, right? You're earning the lending borrowing revenue from Maker, but you're also earning some treasuries as well. And so, um, yeah, I think that like to, to get to your question of like how do you actually displace Tether, I think that there is room for a lot of different players and they serve different use cases. Um, I mean, I, I actually think that like one of the big theses that I have um, moving forward is that there's going to be a big dichotomy in stable coins, right? They're going to serve different purposes. So for example, like Nick is, you know, I, I think that Agora stands a pretty good chance of being like one of the top like fully regulated stable coins, right? Because they're going to they're going to split from fully like regulated to fully like decentralized, right? Like if you're, if you have to decide like, okay, are you going to have like a freeze function, right? I mean, otherwise, if you're like kind of in this like amb ambiguous, like decentralized, but you're not really decentralized, you get kind of in like hot water with like regulators. And so most of those parties push to decentralize. Most of the centralized folks like you are essentially like fully, like have no plans for their own token. So I think, I don't think it's, the vision is displacing Tether, um, but I do think that whoever is the most Lindian and is the best at servicing their use case, um, I think that like their market cap could surpass Tether. But I think there's, yeah, you, there's different use cases. I think people don't talk enough about how, you know, they sort of aggregate stable coins into one generalizable asset class, but I think about it more 
is like the fixed income market, right? And you have different core users that want different types of products. So, uh, you know, maybe let's just take Athena's case, right? If you are a trading firm and you want to earn significant additional yield on your collateral, like they're a great product. If you are a payment company that just wants security, uh, regulation, and you know institutional grade backing, you know we're probably a better product than they are, and those are core, you know, different users. Um, how we think about like Tether is you really only have two centralized stablecoin participants that matter today. One is Tether, one is is Circle, um, and with Circle they share about you know half their income with Coinbase. They got going when exchange uh, back stables were launching in 2018, 2019 when they were primarily used to replace BTC as collateral and a quote token on exchanges. Um, today, we have a much broader market environment where you have payment companies, variety of exchanges, chains, different VMs. And we think that there's an opportunity to go really take market share from them. Um, and I think there's a portion of it that we can take from Tether. But Tether is like sort of like uh, you know the Bitcoin ETH meme is you know, there's no competitor uh, for, for Bitcoin, but there's hundreds of competitors for ETH. So I think you know probably 60% of Tether's market cap is probably going to stick with Tether no matter what. But I think there's an opportunity to you know one take share from Circle, take some share from Tether, but also I think you know this market grows 100x, which benefits everyone on stage here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't have much to add. I I, I agree with both uh, perspectives. This market is tiny, so it will grow a lot. Even if Tether keeps 70% of the market share. There is still space to have like several multi-billion dollar companies. Now, obviously, Tether is not going to keep 70% market share because it's optimized for a certain use case, which is not the only use case we're going to have for digital money. Right? We don't use money just for, for gambling. We use money for many other things. So I agree. Uh, from an M0 perspective, the only thing that I can add is that we keep obsessing ourselves with, the, with money as a product for payments and doing stuff. Uh, there, is all, there is a whole machine stack behind it, how actually you produce the product. Um, that's what we're trying to innovate at M0, like recreating the monetary stack that, that um, allows the production of digital money and getting more people involved so that it's not only everything funneled through the banks. And that allows a better and more programmable, smarter way to share and move yield or margins around, that's what we're doing. So we're doing really infrastructure so that a lot of those deals that now are paper-based and marketing-based are really going to exist at an infrastructure level in DeFi on-chain. But I, 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 I truly agree with what the guys have said. Like, you know, this is a tiny market. I mean, imagine, like, if we have space to create, like, 50 tethers in the next 10 years, I mean, why should we spend time <laughs> in other sectors? I think it's a pretty exciting place to be. Definitely a good sector to be in. I, I agree. Um, Seraphin. Yeah. Um, the nice thing about Tether is that they got lots of verticals where they're good at. They're good at stablecoin transfers. They're good at uh, CD fine lending facilities. But they're also pretty good at uh, being used as collateral for perps trading. So the inspiration for Athena was that a lot of USDT is used to trade perps and centralized exchanges. But when you hold USDT and trade Bitcoin and ETH perps, you're not earning any yield on that. So we thought, if we had a token that had yield from that funding, we could probably go up to 20% of Tether's market ca market cap at least, which is what we did. And as you probably know, we listed on Binance, uh, on Bybit as a collateral token for trading perps. And that's kind of the direction where we are taking, where we're not going up to, at the moment up to Tether's stablecoin transfer market where people use it in emerging markets, more rather up to the centralized exchange bit where it's used as collateral for perps. Um, that's probably the more interesting vertical for us at Athena. Um, th thank you all for that. Uh, if you could snap your finger and remove a blocker to your business today, what would that blocker be? All right, I guess I'll start. Um, is it regulators? <laughs> this is not in the questions. Is it, uh, <laughs> I would say that like probably the time, the time lindiness, like, that is the biggest thing with the stable coin is that like people aren't going to put their life savings in something that's just not been around. Like we DUSD launched three weeks ago. Like at, at the end of the day, like that's no time. And for people to actually trust that, I mean, we built up a lot of on-chain liquidity. But like if I'm I'm putting myself out, taking myself out of the elixir shoes, and I'm I'm a retail user, and I see this new another stable coin, like that's not compelling. Like I'm not 
like it's just like okay well like what is the actual incentive right yield is a big thing and i think seraphim had a really good point like USDT and USDC, the fact that they're not paying any yield, like, is a great thing for everyone here on this stage because it means that, like, you know, you can sit there and you can have, you know, hold a, hold USDT or USDC, right, and, you know, have pretty good trust. Or you can see a decentralized stable and you can see the backing, you can see whatever with permissionless mint redeem or whatever it is, um, and you can earn 10% while you have that, right? So that's very compelling and that will always be compelling as long as that, like, ARB exists. And so for me, I would remove the lendingness so that you can actually like people will believe a, a time machine yeah, exactly yeah i think everyone here would want more liquidity so i'll not say that but something that's been interesting to see early days is like how fragmented the price feed space is so uh we launched two months ago you know, we're on three chains already or we're gonna be on a fourth this week uh, i didn't realize how many different oracle providers there were for different applications and so you know we're on some of the largest on the chains that we're uh, on already but some of been held up purely because they're working with legacy price feed providers who move slow. And so if I could remove all those blockers, we'd be on a lot more applications from the get-go. Um, but you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of, of price feeds um, and participants that have come to market recently, you know, like Pith, Chaos just announced uh, that are moving quickly and you know, we're working with. But that's like a unique hangup that probably people aren't aware of in the early days. I'm not American, so I risk it. If I had the magic wand, I would absolutely remove the U.S. Democratic Party. <laughs> not the whole U.S., right? Just the Democratic oh. Party. Oh, only the DNC. Yes. Got it. Um, understood. Understood. That's um, quite ambitious. Um, Seraphim. Yeah, I could bitch about anything really for hours, but I think if I picked two, I guess it would be... The regulatory landscape is precarious. You never know if you get sued or go to jail or whatever. It feels like at this point in crypto, going to jail is like the peak of your career. Uh, I think we should change that. Um, the second is just the layer two fragmentation is really annoying because you have to build liquidity every single time and talk to new people every single time. It's just really annoying. Um, so yeah, just the fragmentation of liquidity and the regulatory landscape should probably change. And it's changing. I mean, we have Mika and all that stuff and we're applying for it, but it's just um, it's kind of... Uh, constant precarious position of being afraid i think we're all facing yeah. totally so maybe pick up on a theme here uh, eliminating the dnc and uh, regulators um if you had a, another magic button and this magic button allowed you to decide what regulators do for two years what would you have them do i, I i'll take this i'm you know i spent a lot of time in my life Talking to regulators, I used to be, I used to sit on a board of an ECB regulated bank in Europe. So like I've, I've seen it a lot. I think that there are two way, two, two sides of the regulatory uh, debate. Uh, I think regulators are very useful, by the way. Uh, I think that regulators should keep protecting the users. Uh, it's not only the only thing they do. Uh, because, you know, the regulators keep saying, ah, we want to protect the users so they don't lose their, their money. I'm pretty sure you can enter in a casino in Vegas and spend all your money. And nobody, nobody will argue with you. Uh, so I think that what the only thing I would try is to focus the regulators on substance and user protection instead of protecting um, ex ante a sector which is like the traditional banking sector. Half of regulation is protection on securities land. The other one is protecting all the intermediaries that are doing monetary transmission. And most of that lobbying is actually not un unnecessary. So I, I would love regulators to focus on the outcome of what the new technology can do instead of just trying to protect profit centers or existing players in an industry per se. Do you feel that the regulator's current position comes from, um, you know, a place of, um, you know, they're they're still ramping up on the space, or is it coming from a place from of regulatory capture? I'm curious for your read on that. I think is uh, risk aversion, resistance, and lobbying. Because if you if you actually talk to a central banker, uh, I think central bankers understand DeFi way better than most builders in DeFi because these guys are very smart how they understand monetary transmission, et cetera. Some of them, right? Uh, so I think it's risk aversion, uh, a bit like resistance to innovation because that's who they are. Otherwise, it would be entrepreneurs. And, you know, exposure to lobbying, which is real. 
I think it also depends on the market that you're in. Um, just our experience with regulators is there are many that are extremely smart on this stuff. Like a few call outs is like one, we're all sitting in Singapore here for a reason. Um, say Hong Kong has been um, smart on the structuring, at least of stable coins and being really thoughtful about it. Uh, and then I actually was particularly impressed with ADGM, not just like their knowledge of the space, but their knowledge at a technical level. I think, unfortunately, uh, some of the Western regulators are a lot um, slower. Um, and maybe that's because it's the incentives, right? If you're sort of the emerging economies, uh, or a smaller economy where you're trying to attract a lot of capital, you want to have innovation on the front foot. Whereas if you're uh, a much more established financial services industry, you have a lot of forces that may be saying, hey, make sure these innovators slow down to give us time to catch up. Um, so I think there are some regulators that have been you know, exceptional in what they're doing uh, and really leaning in. And, and unfortunately, in some of the, the Western geographies, they're a little bit slower. Um, but I think, you know, hopefully we'll start to see that change over the next couple of years, particularly as there's very clear legislation in places like Bermuda or Singapore or Hong Kong or the UAE, you know, and even Europe. Although, you know, I have certain qualms with Mika, at least like they're making an a, you know, attempt at it and passing legislation, which is not what they're doing uh, in the United States. Seraphim, do you have any uh, views as perhaps the one that's furthest out on the risk curve? Um, yeah, I think... It would be great if regulators had a bit more good faith probably towards us as an industry. They don't seem to trust us uh, that we do basic compliance, even though I'm pretty sure everyone here, when they mint stable coins or USD assets, they do KYB, they do like uh, AML, all that stuff. I think a lot of regulators probably assume immediately we're all scumbags and why would they trust us? Look at us. I get it, right? But, <laughs> like, uh, but I do think a bit more good faith would be great and I can see why they don't have it because uh, this industry, we've been fucking up for a few years now with FTX and such, but um, just a bit more good faith, I think would be great because uh, we're all trying to do what's right. Actually, if you open up the books and see the processes behind what Athena's doing, what you guys are doing, they'll find that we're actually quite reasonable and doing everything we can to prevent like terrorism, financing and all that shit to come through. So. Totally. Um uh, less shit, more uh, more competence. Absolutely. Um, how much does yield matter? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to stir Thanks. up some disagreement between the four of you. So to I, the end I, user? To the end user, yes. Zero. Okay. So Lucas' zero. view is zero. Seraphim, as a provider of a yield product, what do you think about that? Before he starts, <laughs> it, they, if, it matters, if you need, but you need to give them a lot of yield. So that's what these guys are doing, which I think maybe right you goal. two could go at it for a little bit. They're, they're not here for our pretty faces on Twitter. Like they're here for the yield, really. Uh, yeah, I think yield is everything. When yield was sixty nine percent in March, people were just like selling their cats and kids and just putting it to Athena. I mean, like this market just wants yield. The whole DeFi is basically a prime brokerage for yield. I think so. Uh, what we realized, though, I guess one of the observations we had was it's great when you're the 65%. It's not great when it's minus five and it goes back to 15. So what we've been working on is not just yield, but decreasing the volatility of yield. Um, we actually, I mean, kind of alpha, but we added our WA in the back end, like half a billion bucks, um, so that the rate on the Athena is going to be at least the repo rate or around that. Uh, we also started doing deliverable futures which means you can lock in three months, six months rates. So like, it's not going to be 65% one day, one the other day. It's going to be around a more sustainable, more predictable yield profile. So yeah, it seems like people do care about yields. They also care about the volatility, volatility of the yield is what we found. Um, and I guess, uh, but yeah, I do think literally this whole industry is just about yield, uh, in my opinion. But, uh. So Seraphim is uh, optimizing a sharp ratio. He, he thinks that yield does deeply matter. Uh, Luca, why is he completely wrong? No, no, he's not wrong. I, let, me, let me rephrase. I think that... Um, it's funny when you speak in third person. It's really funny. But, <laughs> no, but, but it's... I, so I'm trying to stay neutral. If you, like, stepping back, like, you know, we all, like, if we're thinking of stable coins as some sort of proxy or risk-free, and we're saying, okay, the treasuries are backing its 5% yield and an issuer is keeping 100%, we should give it to the user. I, an end user doesn't care at all about the risk-free rate. That's why we all, we all have our money in a bank account, and we don't really even look at what is the yield that a bank account is giving us. It's super sticky. 
And this is the 101 of banking. The banks work because there is a huge margin between the cost of liabilities and the asset yield. That's, that's, that's the point. So I think that what is, um, so you can, if you want to attract consumer users with yield, then you have to provide them a high yielding product, which is what these guys are doing, which I think is a very, is a very interesting strategy. Then it's a different asset, uh, as we were saying. But I think what I wanted to say is that there are certain um, players along the stack that really care about it, and with, like the large distributors. Like if you are like an exchange and you're managing hundreds of millions of dollars of stable coins and you have a huge treasury, you really care about that yield. So in, in my opinion, having the ability to move the margin along the stack so somewhere in between 100% to the user, to the issuer, and 100% to the end user, is the is the, the game. That makes sense. Uh, Nick, maybe yeah, you have I was going to say well. dep it depends on the user, and there's hundreds of billions of dollars in checking accounts that prove people don't care about yield. 100%. So um, maybe one camp here is they say, look, let me look at a bank deposit beta. And a bank deposit beta is not particularly high. So why on earth would you think that yield matters so much? There's a trillion dollar industry today, trillion dollars of market cap, betting on the fact that yield does not matter. Seraphim, what, what do you say to that? Yeah, I guess I was talking more about the current user base of DeFi and CeFi. But I agree if we go, I guess, beyond what we currently have in this industry. Yeah, the grandmas and gram grandmas don't care about the yield that much. Um, I guess the question is how do we, I feel like before, well, at least on the Athena side, before we even get to those savings accounts, um, what we're going to need is to onboard more CFI. So what we've done with Bybit, or replicate that with all the sexes would be ideal. Uh, I think in the end, even if we have agreements with retail kind of uh, providers that just give, but you use, you, you use the assets to savers and stuff. In the end, we'll have to share some yield probably. So it matters what that yield is because we can share more, which means uh, they can earn more money. So I think it matters in the end, even if you talk about retail distribution, just on B2B basis. Um, but I suppose I agree because I was talking more about the current CFI and DeFi, which is just about yield. Beyond it, it might be a bit different, which is fair. Totally. I, I wonder how we think this market plays out in the next five years, in the next 10 years, um, in the next 50. Do the banks eventually take over and uh, maybe purchase some of these companies and have a superior balance sheet and therefore have edge? Do they just fall asleep at the wheel and uh, let us eat the whole thing? I, yeah, there's a lot of noise made about being, you know, banks launching stable coins or, you know, maybe buying a stable coin. Maybe they buy a big one in, in the future, like maybe JP Morgan does, but most of these banks are not going to ever launch a stable coin because it's a lot less capital efficient than their current business model, which is leverage, right? Um, and for them to launch a stable coin in a matter, they need to accrue net new capital to their ecosystem, right? So if Goldman Sachs launches, you know, Goldman Sachs coin, right? JPM, Morgan Stanley, all their competitors are not going to use it. And so there's going to be very little utility outside their existing ecosystem. So I think it's, you know, maybe some of these banks will try it as an experiment or use it internally within their own ledger. But I, I don't think any of these banks will launch a stable coin that is a large, global, successful stable coin as we think about them today. Um, I think what they'll probably and more likely do is have tokenized bank deposits. The issue with that is that they're not fungible. The creditworthiness of State Street is much greater than the creditworthiness of SVB. Uh, and so that also creates problems. Um, so I think it's very unlikely that banks get into the stablecoin space in a meaningful way anytime soon, um, but maybe ever. I would say that the fintech providers might, though. So I could see, like, for example, PayPal as, like, they have their USD, right? And then I, I could see, like, Venmo launching their own dollar, like, behind the scenes, but I don't see, like, a bank. So, like, yeah, I don't think Wells Fargo is rolling out Wells Fargo coin anytime soon. Yeah, well, I think they're really valuable is within their own ecosystems, right? Because then you have the same issue with PayPal, Right is if you are a B2B remittance company, you're not going to be using PiUSD, right? Because you're effectively funneling money to your competitor, right? So I guess maybe if it's, it's how you want to segment it, but I think a lot of the existing companies will use them for internal mechanisms, but they won't be large, broader network effects, stable coins like you see with Tether. Yeah, I, I, I agree. We'll try to go one step further. Uh, so I, I agree like banks for... For banks, narrow banking is an unprofitable business, so they will, they will try to 
they, they are not attracted by it. On the other side, it's very attractive for fintech actually to be issuers of stable coins because currently for every fintech, there is a bank behind it. So they're leaving a, lot, a large margin to the bank behind it. So why should they? On the other side, I don't believe in a future where we have like 100 different types of stable coins because stable coins are scope economy products. You need liquidity and aggregation. And that's actually the, the whole thesis of what we're doing. So like the M0 project is a, when we say money middleware, like it's a project that is creating technology and standards so that 100 different fintechs can issue the same stable coin. And they, have, they can enjoy the margin from the same similar margins across the stack. So that uh, you know, other projects and other like like if you are like a remittance business in Brazil, and you want to actually enjoy the margin in the floats that you're actually intermediating, you're not forced to leave it to PayPal. You can you can actually set yourself up, connect to the M0 protocol, issue a stable coin, the same stable coin, and get the benefits of the margins, but without fractionalizing liquidity further. Uh, I mean, what Seraphine was saying, like you know, to, to bootstrap liquidity. I don't know if it was like Nico Seraphine, like. It's very difficult for every project to bootstrap liquidity from scratch. So entering actually into this, imagine if we could all issue white, white labeled USDT, everyone would do it immediately. So I fully agree with the thesis and that's why we're building on top and trying to create an aggregation layer that can allow other people, different, issue, different issuers to issue the same asset. Yeah, generally as an industry, I think we're growing quite quickly. So we have $130 billion worth of treasuries or such. So uh, if in five or 10 years, we 10x from here, we have one point something trillion dollars, that's as much as Japan or China holds in their balance sheet. And I think I, I would really like to, I'm really interested to see what happens next. Is it like Tether just owns US government and finances it directly, or they'll have to create a nation state with diplomacy and such to, you know, prevent them from being killed or something, uh, or they have to work much more actively with uh, authorities and such because it's really tricky when sixty guys finance your country, right? So, or just us as an industry as well. So, uh, yeah, I have no idea what's going to happen. I think what most likely is that we're going to, as we grow really, really big, we're going to start working a lot more tightly with governments as we start to finance them uh, through bond purchases and such. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll have to put on the suit then. We'll see. Maybe I'll be out there. <laughs> <laughs> suit with a chain. Um, uh, most panels, I think sometimes there are two realities. There's sort of the reality presented at one of these conference panels, and then there is the reality of day-to-day -day execution. And I wonder, when you guys think about your daily day-to-day -day execution, what is one piece of consensus stablecoin thinking that is just deeply wrong? Because people don't understand what you're doing on the ground. Can you rephrase the question? What do most think? What do most people think is right in stablecoins? That's actually wrong. I guess I'll start. I don't think. I think before launching the stablecoin, my thought was that like it would be just constant, like oh my god, we're going to depeg and there's alarms going off, and it's like really not like that. Like once you set up the pipes. Like you just have market makers and you have everything and you have a bunch of liquidity and it's like actually like pretty chill as long as like you have that right. And so I think I don't think it's as um, as long as like everything is transparent and viewable for everyone. Um, like I don't I don't think they're. I mean we we kind of launched into like an, a super large like ETH drawdown right and it was like really wasn't all that bad. And obviously we've been in hype for like a month. So we haven't really had too many big, really big stress, stress kind of tests on DUSD. But that being said, like, you know, with there being full transparency on chain and, and with the system working as intention, like we haven't even had like a slow, slightly close call and we don't envision having one um, as long as like everything is fully transparent and viewable on chain. Uh, one that's probably only specific to us is the bigger the bank you work with, the older the tech stack. And so, you know, we have the good fortune of working with one of the largest custodian banks in the world. Um, that means they've also been around for hundreds of years. So they don't have, um, you know, as many of the plug and play APIs built in that you would like to have and, and the automation that you can sort of tap into. So you have to build a lot of that yourself, whether it's with OCR or other things, so that, you know, when a balance hits your account, you know, it automatically registers and, and you can mint. Um, so that's probably specific to us. I would say the, the one other thing is just simply 
you know, if you want to build a global stablecoin, you have to really regionalize, um, you know, your company. And what I mean that by that is, you know, hiring people that, you know, both live in Argentina and Singapore because there's various different custodians, right? Like in Asia, Kobo and Rakar are two of the biggest custodians. Like no one in, you know, the Europe or United States or LATAM really uses them. And so, you know, working with all the different infrastructure players across different regions uh, and getting them set up at one time is a lot of work um, and part of the secret sauce. But that's also, uh, I think, a challenge that people probably don't think about. I don't know. I mean, I, on my side, I've always been a lateral thinker in monetary use cases in general. Like people obsessed with stablecoin as a payment product. For me, payment is actually one of the least interesting uses of money in general. But I think the only, the only thing I could say is that outside of, build, in, of uh, companies, at least within M0, there is a tether obsession. Like, you know, we kind of like know the ship has sailed and tether. Like, and, I don't think there is any of that obsession if you if you talk to people that are building because I think most of people of the people that started building in this space with high conviction they know like what we were saying before like right? this is like the market today is so tiny 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 the use case the use cases we are covering today are so narrow that really we just need to do great businesses great products we need to scale there is a cold start problem is true but there is really not an obsession with incumbents or way less than what people think. Yeah, I think some two observations that I think are interesting is first, what Nick said is true. Like the Asian and the Western crypto crypto finan financial systems are very separate. Like people have no idea what Kobo is, which is a you know, pretty big deal here. And the Western is, yeah, or like uh, th there's lack of basically lack of communication a lack of trust for some reason as well between the, those two uh, uh, ecosystems. So what we've tried to do at the team is try to bridge them. We have a spectrum of trapped by guys like Brevin uh, and going all the way to some family offices in Hong Kong. So I feel like it's quite rare when these people meet together in one product. Um, I think the second observation is that this space uh, is incredibly concentrated in a few LPs, like much more than most people think. You're not targeting like retail users at all. You're targeting uh, distribution centers that have access to retail users or just whales and funds. There's literally probably like, I don't know, 50 uh, entities that account for 80% of the stablecoin liquidity or so, uh, one way or another. So. Uh, the execution day to day is literally just knowing these people, talking to them, uh, making sure they trust you. Um, that's kind of uh, that's different from what I thought. But then again, it was the same with Lido. <laughs> so why, why, why am I surprised? Nick? But yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Well, please join me in thanking us for our four eminent speakers, and uh, thank you all for coming.